morning everybody it's a great, uh, great privilege uh, to introduce our virtual chief guest well known uh, chief consultant physician of uh, national institute of uh, infectious disease dr anand vijayakrama the immediate uh, past president of uh, sion college of physicians he is uh, one of the most acknowledged academic in the country who has worked in the forefront of managing dengue and covid <clears throat> it is unfortunate for not to have him with us today in person but it is very fortunate to have him live amid his very busy schedule so let us uh, move on this presentation over to you dr vijay thank you very much Can I share my slides, please? morning and uh, please give me a minute until i start sharing my slides I can't share the slides. Good morning, and uh, I born. Uh, Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be the uh, chief guest of this important event. Uh, in fact, uh, I, when I accepted uh, this invitation, I was planning to come to Badulle uh, and uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason was uh, I was very happy to accept this invitation because uh, after my foreign training, as uh, uh, after completing my foreign training as a consultant physician, the first station I served was Badulla. Uh, and then uh, 18 years ago, or, uh, yes, in 2002, I was the secretary of the Uber Clinical Society. So because of uh, these uh, two things, I wanted to come to Badulla, but unfortunately, you do other. Uh, unforeseen commitments, I uh, had to join you virtually. Going with your theme, I thought of uh, talking about facing, living, and working with COVID-19. The present situation as of uh, midnight yesterday was this. The world has reported 96 million COVID cases. There are 24 million of those were from US and another 10 million was from uh, India and so on. So each country, especially in the West and the Europe, we see a rise of COVID cases, including a rise of death. This is the, uh, the new cases across the world and daily deaths across the world uh, from the beginning of this outbreak. You can see how increasing both are. And as of uh, just as of today, so there are about 16,000 patients dying because of COVID. 
when you consider the mortality initial estimated mortality was around 3 to 5% in china however the rate among patients admitted to hospital the hospital fatality rate was around 15% in china when you look at uh, certain clinical trials they also show a similarly high fatality rate in the solidarity trial interim report showed a uh, death rate of around 7 to uh, 8 to 12% and similarly similar results similar figures are shown in remdesivir trial as well as uh, the more higher rates are shown in the recovery trial where even the dexamethasone group which is supposed to have benefited from using dexamethasone still has a mortality rate of 22.9% which is a very high mortality rate for hospital acquired hospital admitted patients the biggest challenge in this is the lack of treatment since the beginning of the epidemic huge number of trials have been con uh, conducted and started just within 8 weeks of beginning of the epidemic more than 300 clinical trials were started and as of today more than 4000 clinical trials worldwide are being conducted on looking for a remedy for this disease most of these trials are from europe as you can see and in from north america and uh, surprisingly the the number of trials in asia is uh, not very high in spite of we having various modes of uh, treatment advocated and also thought of many pharmacological agents have been tested antivirals anti uh, malarials antibiotics monoclonal antibodies and so on however as of today no definite treatment have been found for this the biggest complication we see in this is the pulmonary complication leading to hypoxia and respiratory failure we look at a chest x-ray or ct scan of the chest in these uh, patients we would see multiple shadows for which the pathogenesis is not fully understood this has resulted in various modes of ventilation looking for more icu beds and providing more icu beds with ventilators producing icu ventilators and so on. if you look at the uk figures the usual uh, ventilator production per week in the us was 700 in 2019 however by end of april this has increased by tenfold it has become 7000 ventilators produced per week in the us because of this pandemic in spite of this there had been excess deaths noted in, in the US, in, in other West of Western countries. And so thousands are getting infected, thousands are dying, and hospitals are overflowing. Uh, and in some places, the necessary protective equipment are running out of stock. The healthcare staff is getting infected. And because of all this, is the article from uh, BBC. Threat of, it says the threat of contagion can twist our psychological response to ordinary interactions, leading us to behave in unexpected ways. The article goes on to say, really the threat of disease occupies so much of our thinking. For weeks, almost every newspaper has stories about the coronavirus pandemic on its front page. Radio and TV programs have back-to-back -back coverage on the latest death stories. We see in our TV and media as well today. And depending on who you follow, social media platforms are filled with frightening statistics, practical advices, and gallows of humor. The author continues to say, this constant bombardment can result in heightened anxiety with immediate effects on our mental health. But the constant feeling of threat may have other more insidious effects on our psychology. Due to some deeply evolved responses to disease, fears of contagion led us to become more conformist and tribalistic and less accepting of eccentricity. Our moral judgments became harsher and our social attitudes more conservative. And this has led to discrimination of patients by society, health facilities, criminalization of COVID positive patients, closing down of factories, offices, etc., various restrictions, economic recession worldwide, and so on. When we look at the context of Sri Lanka, the first patient, as you know, was reported on 26th of January, that's a Chinese national, and the first local patient was re reported on 10th of March.
By early August, we had uh, almost 3,000 cases with uh, only 11 deaths. Uh, by that time, a lot of quarantine measures were adopted. The airport was shut down on 19th of March for passenger flights, and there was a travel ban, and there was mobility restriction across the country, and various uh, uh, financial and other allowances are given to selected populations, and only essential services were and selected services were maintained. There was direct involvement from His Excellency the President and the top government people. Their staff was headed by Director General of Health Services and Command of Army. And then there were many committees uh, headed by key politicians, several committees in the Ministry of Health, and the quarantine facilities were handled by Army. As you know, there was a lockdown, close of airport, to gradu then gradual reopening. So we were doing pretty well. We can see there were small clusters, first uh, uh, from uh, uh, Navy garrison, and then from Kandakadu camp, and then uh, this is from the uh, repatriates coming from Middle East countries. However, in spite of these small outbreaks, they were well controlled and we were doing pretty well. And for two months, we didn't have cases from the community. And then we forgot we have to live with COVID. And we relaxed. Not only the general public, even the politicians, the political leaders, so-called, relaxed. You can see many were not wearing masks. And everybody who is wearing a mask is not is wearing it incorrectly. So that is the level of uh, relaxation we went through. And that led to a beginning of another cluster coming from Minuangoda. And this is the present situation, as you all know. And this indicates, and together with the world situation, that we will have to live with this COVID for a year or more at least. And this, across the world, has uh, generated various scenarios or predictions. This is an article from uh, the fu future, from the nature, uh, the pandemic's future. This is uh, uh, written by a, a researcher. And the, he, uh, the researcher goes on to share, uh, say a scenario uh, in June 2021. The world has been in pandemic mode for a year and a half. The virus continues to spread at a slow burn. Intermittent lockdowns are the new normal. An approved vaccine offers six months of protection. This is a scenario. Right? But international deal making has slowed its distribution. An estimated 250 million people have been infected worldwide and 7.7 .7 million are dead. So such scenarios have been thought of and some of these could be true at least to some extent. So what should we do? As doctors, I think our primary responsibility is towards the healthcare. So what we should do in hospitals? The priority number one is the safety of healthcare workers. In, in contrast to other situations where the priority in our work in hospitals is the patients, in this instance, the priority of number one is the safety of healthcare workers. Because otherwise, the fear, if the healthcare workers are not protected, the fear itself will lead to refusals to see suspected patients, refusals to attend patients until a negative PCR is available, unnecessary use of personal protective equipment, employing measures to distance the patient from healthcare worker. We see some of these things are happening at present. Partition like partitioning of wards, using robotic trolleys to distribute food, drug, etc., and then producing equipment for distant care. This is an article from Lancet. The, the, the topic is no patient safety without healthcare worker safety. So the primary aim is to protect the healthcare worker. And what are the measures? Uh, most of these are simple measures. Hand washing, practicing cough etiquette, avoiding unnecessary gatherings, maintain physical distancing, minimize touching surfaces unnecessarily, disinfecting surfaces, using face masks and wearing those properly, use of personal protective equipment appropriately and correctly. You can see most of these measures are simple when you look at them. However, practicing these things in the in our day-to-day -day life is not not that easy and it doesn't happen regularly. This is one of our nurses who is uh, prepared to go into the 
uh, ward of uh, ward with COVID patients, and the, the right side also was the a nurse is uh, drawing blood from a patient. So with appropriate PP, we attend to patients. Not only that, these are seen from our ICU. Uh, wearing protective gears, we provide care, necessary care for these patients in spite of they being COVID positive. You have for the protection, then you can uh, provide the, uh, the care. So the second and third priorities should be the appropriate care and treatment for COVID negative patients as well as COVID positive patients. Now this uh, COVID uh, positive patient in our ward who was in our ward a uh, couple of months ago, uh, you can see I was doing a plural respiration, you can't recognize me, doing a plural respiration and you can see the plural fluid is filling into the bottle of saline. So with all the necessary personal protective equipments, we do all necessary things for these patients and that has to be the way. On the other hand, if you are not doing, becoming so, not doing serious things so close to the patient, you don't need that much of protection. You can see a nurse is a, is a COVID positive patient. A nurse is handing over a packet of rice uh, to these patients. Both of them are wearing face masks and one meter, more than one meter apart, and that is enough. In these good ventilated wards with these half walls, we are keeping these patients in these wards. And you can see we are addressing some of these giving instructions to so these patients. In fact, actually, the, the, the patients organized a party for the nurses' day on that day. So we were having a chat with patients. And uh, so when, the, when, the, when you keep necess take necessary precautions appropriately, uh, you don't have to take unnecessary things. You can have these patients you have to, you, because you know the mode of infection. This, uh, this girl's birthday, we made a little party and us went in to the ward uh, and arranged the party for them. And then on the other, at other times, the people who are well are allowed to come out of the wards and do some exercises, have some sunlight. It's not, a, not an issue. We don't have to keep them in an enclosed space. In fact, that can be bad. So once again, the key methods of prevention is what we have mentioned. And in addition, I would like to stress upon the fact of avoiding smoking in this. So we have to avoid things like this and this. And in that, instead, I think we have to go back to our traditional methods like saying this. Not only in our country, in, in countries like Thailand, India, we see this. Then there are other issues in hospitals, preparing wards, improving facilities, changing habits and practices. And then, so as I said, we use open wards. We don't have to, we should not separate these wards and um, let them have proper ventilation. This is an article uh, from a study in Japan which suggested the there's 18 fold, 7 point, 18.7 risk of higher transmission in indoors compared to outdoor environments. Especially when combined with environment factors such as poor ventilation and crowding in enclosed settings, that will lead to further increase in attack rates. So that is why the good ventilation, less crowding, those are important. And this article further goes on to say, because overcrowded indoor spaces and gatherings likely will continue to be the drive of transmission, public health strategies will be needed to mitigate transmission of these settings. As part of the pandemic response, we may need to consider fundamentally redesigning these settings, including improved ventilation, just as improved sanitation was a response to collapse. So we have to think back. Uh, we have to get involved our architects, engineers, and have good ventilated places inside the hospital as well as other places. And then the other problem is, uh, uh, one of the biggest problems is the changing habits. There are certain good habits and practices which you have to change. People, our tradition is to join together to have meals and such practices have to be avoided. And then we, we talk to people whenever we meet, those should be minimized. And then we hear the tradition has become, it has become a tradition to have parties, gatherings, especially in things like weddings, funerals, and those should be avoided as much as possible. And then the biggest problem, another big problem we have is the exposure to a patient. 
and as i said earlier the smoking plays a big role in this this are uh, these are some figures from a study from china it says that when you take uh, the total population of uh, 1085 33% smokers in this population had severe or critical illness in contrast to only 19% of non smokers having critical and severe illness so the smokers have a much greater risk of having the illness as well as dying from the disease so once again we have to uh, stick to the key methods and which has to be adhered to and and uh, advocated all the time with this <coughs> and then it's a crisis as uh, winston churchill said i believe we should not face this crisis it depends how you look at this crisis you can look at this in a very negative point of way on the other hand you can see whether there could be in spite of these negative things there could be positive things as well so what can we do as an institution as a family or individual and as doctors as we as in the hospital work as a team and these are the acknowledgments we got and this our team part of our team and uh, in fact we did not uh, modify any of our words they are as they were uh, on the other hand we got other facilities improved this uh, uh, air force building a uh, isolation unit you can see on the right hand lower corner the unit prepared made and uh, then we got a ct scan and a radiology section donated by group of engineers from morocco university and uh, then we got a diagnostic molecular diagnostic laboratory and then we got a new nursing quarters given by uh, uh, the building was uh, managed or, or the process was managed by the port authority chairman uh, so we got many things to the hospital as an institution i think we are doing well as a family what can we do this uh, the professor of psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry says on this the family resilience the capacity for a family to weather and even thrive during adversity depends on a family's ability to balance stability and flexibility in changing circumstances you know our circumstances are changing pretty fast this work in progress calls for an attitude of we are all in this together and let's do the best we can i think that is what we should try to do and there are many issues the family faces parenting relationship and uh, having a constructive dialogue because now the family is together most of the time with these restrictions addressing the sibling issues and conflicts which are becoming more with this and then on the other hand you have to protect yourself and the persons you are care for and caring for someone who is clinically extremely vulnerable like you are, like your grandmother or grandfather and then maintain your own health while you are looking after others these are some of the issues of course there are many issues but as a family I think we have to look at that then on the other hand there have been many inventions and innovations these are few you know inventions from outside the uh, sri lanka and uh, this uh, delivery robo or transporting supplies in the uk in sri lanka too we have seen many inventions and some of these are like this the locus video laryngoscope made by a doctor microorganism diverting and cleaning device mechanical cardiopulmonary resuscitator uh, air seal intubation bag uh foot operated door handle and so on on the other hand some of these invention has uh, i wonder whether we have lost the human touch because of this some of these inventions those are uh, made in good faith but probably not appropriate i came across a nice article written by uh, one professor ajit alvis he went in to say inventions coming and going when the dust settles what may we have so we have to look at this and think what we should have for the future and encourage such infections and he ends his article saying one big hope with the virus is that it would be it would enable creating an ecosystem for the inventor and researcher to take the uh, leadership for innovation mental of leadership for innovation i think if that happens i think as a country we can prosper on the other hand the doctors have a big role in this 
we have to advocate and as an advocacy role sometimes it is very difficult because we have to ad uh, advocate to people including uh, politicians which becomes very difficult and then on the other hand uh, in organizing our setup our hospital the ward the our the house all that i think we have a very big role as doctors in in this setting. we have to take the leadership especially in your hospital in your units we you should take the leadership and get the team involved to face this crisis because we will have to live with this crisis and in addition there's ample opportunity for other things like research and innovations and we have to look positively and work for this because we will have to look we will have to live with this covid at least for another year or two thank you Thank you very much uh, for the kind presentation and also very informative one. And uh, uh, I am Dr. Nimal, a consultant committee physician working in Uwa Province. So I, as for the uh, participants, uh, uh, I would like to know uh, uh, the future trend of this outbreak in Sri Lanka because uh, the Ministry of Health is going to start the vaccination program uh, next uh, in next couple of months so what would be the situation that uh, of covid 19 in coming months in sri lanka that will be a situation which, uh, which is very difficult to predict uh, in fact uh, the ministry of health and the government of sri lanka is going to uh, start the vaccination program not within months within hopefully within couple of weeks uh, so the priority groups will be in this will be the, the frontline healthcare workers and uh, then the uh, people above the age of uh, 60 and also the people with selected comorbidities like uh, CKD and uh, diabetes. Uh, the, there are many issues with this. Uh, the vaccine has been uh, several vaccines we are, which are coming now, which are in the use, have shown an efficacy rate of more than 90, 90%. However, we, nobody knows how long this protection lasts because we had no time to see the follow-up. Generally, when a vaccine is produced or before coming to the market, it, it, the, it is followed up for at least 10 years. Due to the urgency of the situation, these vaccines had to be approved and uh, we hope that the, the, the protection will last for a long period. However, unfortunately, nobody can predict how long it will last. So it all depends on how the situation is. And then the other question is like in the case of uh, influenza, with the changing of uh, the, the with mutations of the virus, there may be viruses resistant to the vaccine produced. So again, only the time will tell how resistant or how much that those resistant virus uh, will prevail or spread. So all, all are in, an, in a very uncertain situation. So therefore, 
in spite of these uh, these possibilities of having vaccination and and all those measures i i believe we have to take the necessary preventive measures to protect ourselves our family members and the community because that is probably the only way of facing this or facing this crisis and while doing that i believe we have to continue with our work while taking necessary precautions otherwise we can't just stop things because this going this is not going to end soon Uh, I believe there are no more questions. We can uh, finish uh, this presentation, and uh, I wish you all the success for your program. And once again, I am uh, sorry that I could not come there in person. Uh, however, it was a pleasure to joining you virtually, at least. Thank you.
सो अभी यहाँ दे रहे हैं नहीं करें तो नहीं तो नहीं एक और अपना एक जन हमारे साथ Is that? 
the late PCD diagnosed myocardial infarction, where I initially the myocardial infarction is not manifested, but later on the two waves that they stayed in the circle, and then the my stable effect. Now, as soon as the patient presents, the diagnosis would be probable as a if the clinical findings are suggestive before the ECG is done. So the level one, as you do the ECG, you classify a good condition syndrome, CQSG elevation and condition. Now level two, where you have the troponin source of protein, the ST elevation plan infarction becomes like the staining of Prince Vettel's angina due to coronary artery and the non-ST elevation by elevation that you can't see becomes either unsteady or unstable. And level three, which we diagnose a few days later, some people have two waves, some do not even have two waves, and some people have two waves. Now, two management schemes go hand in hand: the general management and the decision and implementation of specific recurrent strategies to do my body, the two quadrants. General management of the AMI, I will not go into details for a lot of time. Try to insert two IV lines, especially in large infarctions, because the complications are likely. You need two IV lines going in, and they must be as close to the heart as possible in the upper limbs, because the drugs take a longer time to reach the heart in a good quantity in countries circulatory deficits. Now, oxygen. It is offered commonly to all patients with the two quantities. But this guideline has been checked, uh, changed to check the pulse oximetry if the saturation is below 90%, oxygen is indicated. But we have problems. We do not routinely administer supplemental oxygen at present. The arterial blood gas must be low, and it is suggested only that patients with ongoing chest pain. Patients with heart failure should be given this oxygen. Why is that? That is because recent studies have shown increased mortality and reduced coronary flow with widespread oxygen use in the population of the good type. This is because on the base of spasm, that type of oxygen therapy. Now, the guidelines refer to SAO, that is arterial oxygen saturation. But in clinical practice, we have found SPO, which we get from the pulse of the image. Because the SAO2 is not possible. It is now accepted that the guidelines which say SAO2, we can substitute the SPO2 in our clinical management. Now, when it comes to pain relief, often is the drug of drugs. And we will not go into the details of the administration, but we have some certain problems. Now, morphine needs to be modification and decrease the preload is good, but it is detrimental in the setting of right ventricular myocardial infarction and right ventricular myocardial infarction, morphine administration may lead to a cardiogenic, a, a, a cardiogenic shock syndrome and therefore it should be mostly broken. If morphine cannot be given, the best analysis is nitrous oxide mixture, 50% oxygen, 50% nitrous oxide. The NSAs and COX-2 inhibitors and so should not be given. Now we have a problem with morphine. Morphine may slow the intestinal absorption of oral antibiotic agents. Therefore, if morphine is administered, the use of ticalbidone and topidogrel may be retarded, and therefore morphine is not given. It, unless very, very urgent in the two countries in the present. It is not so that the better agents. Now, nitrates are more effective than something like nitrates for symptom relief. It has no prognostic benefit. Therefore, nitrates nowadays will be administered only for the control of blood pressure. Take a history. Whether the patient has been on phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, silicon or tetrafil within the past 20 hours, because nitrates can cause life threatening hypotension situation. Now, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, and we expect that it will increase the heart rate. But it is known by the by a basal defects that nitrates can cause a radical. Therefore, the patient has a complete heart block. Or any degree of 
coffin of the body into Venus skin and then point three reading of the is the subcutaneous skin and the full dose is repeated in 12 hours locally as subcutaneous. Now, once you have done all this in the general management, we come to the specific method. You have to cause reperfusion. And what are the reperfusion strategies that we have in the good property? Which are the good property syndrome we need at the intervention? And what time limits should be for? Now, steady and very high risk and stable anxiety. Both need what is called primary PCI. Traditionally, it was thought that only the stainy needs primary PCI, but now we have changed the guideline and very high risk of stable. Not high risk, but very high risk of stable. Also, needs immediate catheter uh, therapy to open up that up. So, the guideline has changed last year. Now, the 2015 BSC guidelines gives the criteria. Or what is called the very high risk criteria of non ST elevation by cutting chop. If there is instant instability, the hemorrhagic instability, or the deletion, the blood pressure is dropping, or the patient is going into heart failure. Recurrent ongoing chest pain, refractory to medical therapy, life threatening arrhythmia, that is weak, mechanical complications of my heart infarction, that is mitral regurgitation or DST. Acute heart failure, that is the flesh pulmonary edema, and the recurrent diamond STT wave changes, particularly with intermittent ST elevation, which comes at those. These are very high risk criteria, and you need one of these is present. The patient needs immediate catheter. Now, the intermediate risk is diabetes, really. Insufficiency, injection fraction less than 40%, also function and etc. But we will not go to those details. Now, the reproductive strategies we have seen we can go in for primary PCI, we can have what is called the pharmaco invasive therapy, and we can have cyclopolysis. Now, when reproduction is done early in the course of staking, patients do not show a rising property and have only a transient PCD changes, which is known as a water demand. That is, the myocardial infarction can be stopped. That is, its reperfusion is done very good in the clinical course. Now, primary delivery of reperfusion therapy, whether pharmacological or mechanical, which staining is most important than the choice of therapy. So, don't worry about doing primary PCI. If primary PCI is getting delayed, then pharmacotherapy or pharmacoinvasive therapy is what is necessary because we must not lose that time is said to be of muscle. Now, timing of invasive strategy was still. Now, the early invasive strategy is where you can do it within 24 hours. Invasive strategy is less than 72 hours, and the selective invasive strategy is after 72 hours. Remember these important time limits. If you have seen the first medical contact to reposition must be less than 120 minutes, that is 2 hours. The first medical contact to reperfusion is less than 120 minutes. If the patient comes to the hospital, the go to device in a PCI capable center should be less than 90 minutes. And if it is not PCI capable, the go to needle time must be less than 30 minutes. So these are important time limits which the treating physician must adhere to in order to save the patient's life and muscle. Now, it is well known that total ischemic time is the most important criteria which results in improved outcome in stemi patients. Now, there are certain drawbacks of shortly door to given time because if you don't do it and you take unnecessary patients to the healthcare, you can find that you are doing unnecessary therapies and therefore. In most peripheral hospitals, it will be thrombolysis, which can be administered very, very easily. Thrombolysis is easily available, economical, and evaluated in several clinical studies, but fraught with the dangers of pre occlusion of the infarctor related area. This is because when you dissolve the clot, you expose the ruptured clot to the circulating vein. And unless you have a 
put and it is on the process going on going. On that exposed ruptured part, a thrombus can occur again though we have lysed. We have lysed the clot and we have exposed the clot to the underlying blood, which has ruptured and therefore this is the problem with thrombosis. If you get thrombosis within one hour or six hours, one set, the benefit is great. In fact, the benefit may be as good as primary patient. We have the term five mil specific thrombolytics and we have the non five mil specific term. Now, what we recommend is the five mil specific uh, Unless you give globally separate for the interest of another clock can occur on that object. And that is why it is not necessary enough to give only for three days. Three months by the day. According to those guidelines, for the interest of that is five days five days for infarctions. Being for the patient. Now, contraindications in thrombosis, you all know, I will not go into that. There are absolutely no contraindications, but there are also non contraindications. Remember, in the situation, seven menstrual cycles, you can give thrombosis. There is no contraindication. That artery pipe and we can tell me can fix. Now, primary PCI is defined as emergency percutaneous stabbing intervention in the setting of stabbing without previous property therapy. Now, this is possible in the PCI capable centers, but not possible in most peripheral hospitals in this country. Therefore, primary PCI is available if available and we have a 24 hour service. It is very good. But if not, what we now recommend is what is called non urgent cardiac degree within 3 to 24 hours. Now, after you give a thrombolytic agent, if you wait for 3 hours and do it like the last week, the bleeding complications are this, and you do it less than 24 hours, the myocardial salvage is great. Therefore, the pharmacoinvasive strategy, the PI strategy says, early thrombosis with selective days, but Indian studies are there in streptokinase also, so you don't have deep, uh, deep in the escape. And then transfer to a PCI capable center within as soon as possible, but if they can do the PCI within 3 to 24 hours. 
So the PCI performs three hours of the compresses, removes the learning both of the phase, so that enoxapar identification does not become bonded, and therefore the patient is not affected. Now there is this trial that the same Thank you very much, sir, for your very uh, elaborative and interesting lecture. So now the uh, forum is open for the questions, and uh, Dr. Knight is very happy to answer the questions related to the topic. So, as so you mentioned, that the copidogrel resistance is very common in the in our country, it's so nearly 40%. So, I know that you are also involved in that uh, research about the copidogrel resistance, and I think you are the best person to answer this question. So, is there any, any test that we can uh, use to uh, diagnose or detect the copidogrel resistance? In that case, we can implement some, uh, administer some other uh, antiplatelet agent. Or maybe increase the dose of copidogrel for a short period, even. So, uh, what, what are your opinion about that? You see, to detect the presence of copidogrel resistance or any antibiotic resistance, there are two methods of doing it. One is called the in vitro method, where you do the plate that function test. Can you hear me? Tampika, can you hear me? Don't know whether they can hear me. Jumpika, can you hear me? We, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there are two methods of determining the resistance or the clinical efficacy of antipater agent. One is the in vitro method, which is by doing the plate function test. The second one, of course, is to see the clinical course of the patient and to see whether the patient gets breakthrough angina latex or acute coronary syndromes while on antipater therapy. Now, it has been shown that, 
antibase that is uh, that function test and clinical resistance don't go hand in hand. That is why we don't do plexus function testing routinely. They don't go hand in hand. So it becomes extremely difficult to know whether the patient is sensitive to cryptogel or resistant. What we have found in this country is that the patients, 40% of the patients are partially resistant. This is the reason why most of us would continue dual antiplatelet therapy indefinitely in patients with acute coronary syndrome. Now, most of us know that after PCI, we give dual antiplatelet therapy, and one current guideline says after one year, stop the clobidogrel and continue only aspirin. Nevertheless, most of us continue clobidogrel indefinitely because of this presence of uh, clobidogrel resistance. And especially if the patient has had breakthrough in general dex or acute coronary syndrome, while on dual antibiotic therapy, it is always wise to continue on board. So this is the answer. We can give ticavilo, but the cost is prohibitive. We can give presbyterol, but presbyterol, the ESA 5 trial, was a trial of acute coronary syndromes. Now we know that after acute coronary syndrome, after six months of acute coronary syndrome, the natural history of these patients turn into the natural history of chronic stable disease. And therefore, the ESA-5 does not uh, really tell us how long we can continue pressure gel uh, because it is a trial of acute coronary syndrome. So the answer is we have to go on our clinical judgment. But most of us, in, especially in the advanced atherosclerotic diseases that we see, we would like to continue dual antibiotic therapy. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, sir, uh, for joining with us today uh, to grace this occasion. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for letting me come here. I would like to apologize for the technical issues. We are indeed in challenging time. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Damika Hadamakun, that's also a neurologist. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Chitra Vijayaratna. Professor Chitra Vijayaratna is currently uh, based in Melbourne, Australia, but he is originally uh, from uh, our area, Ontario. And he is, I think, connected with us now. So, good afternoon, Professor Vijayaratna. Uh, Professor Vijayaratna has uh, graduated from the Faculty of Medicine in Pera Denia and thereafter he has achieved many postgraduate qualifications including MD, PhD and Master of uh, Health. He is a member of uh, uh, various renowned world academic organizations. He holds uh, various prestigious posts at the moment. Uh, he is a professorial uh, Visiting scholar in Larchrobe University, uh, professor in neurology and chair Department of Neurology, director Stroke Services, director National uh, Director Neuroscience Research Unit, director Academic Medicine, and director International Affairs University of University Department of Melbourne, uh, University Department of Medicine, Western Health, Melbourne. He's currently the uh, leader of a very active multidisciplinary research team with strong collaboration with Professor Sheila Kunter. And Professor Tisri Jalatna has extensive uh, international collaboration, including Asia Pacific region, Canada, USA, uh, and New Zealand. He has published widely with 227 peer reviewed publications with more than 42,000 citations. Uh, he is the senior member of the five member social media team for the World Federation of Neurology. And he is the chair of global policy, public awareness, and advocacy for the Federation of Neurology. He is the first Australian academic neurologist to be awarded with the prestigious Pet Monsanto Award. 
So, uh, without taking much time, I invite your other research doctor, Professor Vijay Ratana. Uh, he will be talking about chemical colors in the management of meat. So, over to you, Professor Vijay Ratana. The, the great honor to visit the mother in hospital virtually from Melbourne. My sincere gratitude to Dr. Chami Mugamage, who are clinical society president, and Dr. Chami sorry, Dr. Zahapur, Namik Zahapur, organizing uh, this event. I sincere gratitude to all the council, to the clinical society, and all of you who are here, gathered physically as well as virtually. And as it is uh, quite necessary for us to get together as a medical community and learn from one another, specifically during this uh, unprecedented time. Of course, uh, we live in the middle of a pandemic, uh, and sadly, the lack of uh, scientific basis uh, and the lack of uh, wisdom is causing uh, our task uh, as uh, physicians uh, and healthcare workers to deliver the best healthcare to our patients uh, as best as possible. The only way to combat this uh, is uh, through proper education. Therefore, my sincere gratitude again for the Clinical Society to bring this together despite the hardships we are facing. It is my task uh, to share a few thoughts uh, about clinical purpose uh, in the context of the uh, management of acute medical pain. Given the time allocated, I thought uh, I would not uh, talk about chronic migraine today. However, proper management of acute migraine uh, lead to prevention of chronic migraine. That's the only person to treat the symptom. That is going to occur for treat the symptom of migraine patients. At the conclusion of this presentation, I hope uh, we should be able to educate ourselves. Uh, and eventually, our patients and peers will recognize the migraine as a complex neurological uh, disorder and avoid the pitfalls of this diagnosis. I hope uh, we would uh, walk away from this talk uh, by being able to keep remembering at least uh, three acute migraine treatment interventions that uh, can preferably treat classes. We would also learn the importance of maintaining the care. We would also learn how to design a tailored, stratified treatment plan to the individual patient and depending on the individual patient needs. We would also touch upon the importance of a tool such as HIT 6 minus input trial from questionnaire. Most importantly, we would walk away from this place, if not already today, to be an effective, authentic advocate for. Care and migraine, as well as just the other pain disorders. So, you might wonder why should we care about migraine in the middle of a pandemic uh, while there are a lot of uh, other disorders? Well, migraine is indeed the leading cause of adult disability, working class uh, all over the world, and certainly in Australia, across all age groups, uh, it accounts for 6 million people which is uh, just over one third of the population. This is not much different in Sri Lanka also. When I look at uh, global uh, burden of disease uh, targeting, globally, we have just over one billion people suffering from migraine. The economic cost of this is enormous. However, migraine continue to be neglected is diagnosed, is even by governments, even by governments in Australia, while we have just over 300 governments looked after just over 23 million people. 
It is important to remember that the management of acute migraine is critically important to reduce uh, disability caused by migraine. Migraine is a complex brain disorder. It's not in your mind. It is a bona fide uh, legitimate medical disorder, which is complex uh, and treatment of migraine related migraine, migraine must be individualized uh, and tailored to the patient's uh, clinical features and clinical needs. Clinicians such as us that we should make uh, full use of available medications in a strategic manner. I've written a lot uh, about this topic, uh, and this was endorsed uh, by the recently included uh, World uh, Health uh, Assembly, seven World uh, included in the uh, which is uh, the official organization. So the 80% of the SMT uh, world is coming from four different countries. So let's get to the case. Let me introduce you, Shanti. Shanti, at present 26 years old, in Czech. She noticed that she was experiencing headaches uh, around one to three headaches based per month. Notice the way that I'm telling this story. I'm talking about headache days. One to three headaches days per month, uh, mostly around the period. The headaches are responded well to simple analysis. Few years down the track, uh, when she was about 19 years uh, of age, uh, she noticed that she was experiencing three to four headache days per month. Uh, these headaches uh, were associated with nausea. There was uh, sensitivity to light and noise. Each headache uh, would last at least for 12 hours. Uh, even after one gram of uh, paracetamol, and you're closing 400 milligrams uh, twice daily uh, for several days per month, and there was uh, a way of uh, getting close them in time. When she was about 24 years of age, uh, now she was experiencing 12 headache days per month, again, associated with nausea, light and noise of energy. Headaches lasting now at least uh, for about 16 hours. Uh, and uh, there was associated neck pain and neck discomfort and depression. At least uh, six days per month as well. So when she came to see us, she was 26 years of age. There was rarely a headache free day. So almost every day is a headache day. At least 10 of the headache days are severe headache days, and the analgesic usage and migraine specific medication usage such as it can slow down to 25 days per month. So almost every day she would take the painkillers or medications such as crypto. So let me ask a question. What do you think the Shanti's diagnosis is? One, stress levels. Two, various kinds of traumas. Three, depression. Four, high pressure levels. Five, chronic migraine, medication experience, and other comorbidities. I do about half a minute for you to think about the traumas. So, what do you think the answer is? So the answer is an unfair. She has uh, 25 headache days per month, at least for 20 severe headache days. There is a uh, nausea and life sensitivity in severe headaches, uh, frequent and acute medication, and we have a daily pain and headaches. Or as we can plan to do, we can gain from 12 to 14 days per month. Depression and anxiety. Uh, sleep is all over the show. With very poor sleep, no regular physical exercise. Uh, currently in the second year of PhD with a very supportive boyfriend and family partners. So she has uh, features suggesting of uh, migraine, chronic migraine, meditation, and 
pathway side uh, on the left hand side uh, showing a cartoon of a brain with a slight uh, small remnants uh, in it. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, they have a big uh, story, uh, the image of the big story. Then I tell the patient that uh, your brain is a mild computer with uh, more wires than the stars in the galaxy. Length of these wires uh, are basically similar to traveling around the planet Earth uh, four or five times. Uh, there are about uh, 10 trillion chemical connections among these wires, so it helps uh, both you and me to be who we are. And uh, the migraine uh, the problem is uh, we are genetically made for this world uh, to generate either changes in electricity or chemical activity, generating a wide variety of symptoms. Uh, it is not only a pain, or not a pain, pain is just one of the symptoms. Uh, and then I saw children in my side suffer from it. And then I tell them that my migraine at the moment uh, is like this little red box in the brain. So this is not reasonable to call it the uh, part. Whereas in your case, because you have more than 26 headache days per month, for a number of months, it is like a small So the idea is for you to move from that stall to put that into the small box. Uh, so you said, and if it's uh, use the four faces of my brain that you will see in the carbon very soon, proto or acute, close to etc. And then you give the patient to explain this uh, the, the concept that you see to the patient is good message or uh, and then you introduce the acute uh, the clinical goal, which I come to in a moment. So these are the four phases of migraine. If you want to know more, uh, we have done a migraine movie if you listen. Uh, if you Google uh, migraine because disability Australia, my name, you will see this movie. It is available for YouTube. If you can't find it, uh, if you uh, go to migrainefoundation.org.au website, which I posted on my first slide as the web address. Uh, and the and posted on this YouTube link there also. You're more than welcome to join our migrant foundation and uh, the global uh, special interest group that can share for all foundation of your organization. Become a member, it's free, and you can access all these things uh, also. So the faces of migraine, uh, the the four, the you get prodromal first, uh, anything from three hours to three days. Uh, Visual or other aura occurs in about 15% of the patient. This will last for anything from 5 to 60 minutes. And then typical migraine attack lasts for 4 to 7 hours and goes for 24 to 48 hours. I've discussed this at length uh, in Sri Lanka National Television for the sector. Again, they are also available in YouTube. Uh, and uh, you are very welcome to encourage your patients to watch them. Spend two hours explaining these things in very simple lay terms. So, the idea is that if you're treating a migraine attack, you really need to treat them around here, uh, preferably during prodrome or aura. It is interesting to look at this uh, cartoon. This is where the meat that, that uh, drinking red wine or eating cheese uh, or eating chocolate. Whether uh, it's uh, Kendra's or Cadbury or any other variety, gives rise to migraine attack. Nine out of ten, this is uh, myth. That is because, uh, as a result of the prodrome, most migraine patients, when their brain is already sick, they get food. They, they go and either drink uh, wine or cheese, eat uh, cheese or chocolate uh, if they can uh, access them. And then a few hours later, they get uh, migraine attack. So they didn't get migraine attack because of uh, the red wine, the chocolate, uh, or cheese. Uh, they got that, uh, they had the food craving as part of the illness uh, rather than it causing the, uh, it is leading to the illness. Uh, there are very occasional patients, uh, they can be migraine factors, and uh, nine is the time. It is the part of the illness uh, rather than the cause. Uh, I have uh, had uh, patients with uh, very disabled post-growth lasting for days to weeks, even. They have been in a significant 
actually breaks or the produced mood, the euphoric mood, or lack of confidence mood, disorientation, sometimes. You can see how we say in my bed. So, this is uh, one of my diaries, as you can see, it captures everything the accessibility, symptomatic medication, self prevention medication that they take. If you want to have a copy, shoot me an email and I'll send you a copy. I told you that I introduced uh, the acute uh, treatment uh, goal. We have produced the advantage to the leave and the word Tanya uh, goal. Uh, rather than Shanti. So the, the acute treatment uh, goal is I uh, want Shanti to be pain free in two hours uh, from the onset of pain, and I want uh, her to be pain free the next day morning. So, sustained pain free response is uh, you want your patient to be pain free in two hours from the onset of the pain when they take the acute medication. You want your patient to be pain free the next day morning. So these are the clinical goals of being treating any patient with a type of uh, migraine. By doing so, you are actually avoiding them going into chronic and medication while you stay also. So that's the Eric uh, impact uh, questionnaire or HIP tool. It's a very simple questionnaire to remember when you have headaches, how often is the pain severe? Never, rarely, sometimes, very often, always. Uh, how often do headaches limit your ability to do usual day to day activities? Work, school, and social activities. When you have a headache, how often do you wish you could uh, lie down? In the past four weeks, how often have you felt too tired to do work or media activities because of your headaches? In the past four weeks, uh, how often have you felt fed up or irritated because of your headaches? In the past, how often do headaches limit your ability to concentrate uh, work or day activities? So the highest score that one can get is uh, from hip six is seventy eight. Midas uh, is eighty. So the Midas is actually more than eighty, but these were the scores of the Chanti and Tanya Mohit. The hip six uh, seventy four, the uh, Midas uh, eighty, basically showed that the ratio was seventy nine to the seventy eight. So, migraine treatment of the optimization question is another useful tool to get a right. It needs uh, very easy to pick up. Uh, side effects, I see medication, well tolerated, functional response. Are you able to quickly return to normal activities uh, after taking your medications? Uh, onset of resistance can you count on your medication to relieve your pain within two hours from onset headaches? Uh, just one dose of your medication usually relieve your headaches and keep you away from at least one to two hours to gain form of pain freedom. Are you comfortable enough uh, in global sense? Be able to handle the activities. So if the answers are no, you can talk most of the time, then there are all of us that uh, uh, the needs uh, as you can. Food with the sharp index, uh, treated with Botox or with the toxins in the physiotherapist or the physiotherapist prescribed uh, mineral, migraine prevention, refer that to a different neurologist or headache specialist. Uh, Reassessed by the unlimited needs and treatment goals for the first. So think about that uh, what the answer is going to be. There's only one answer that is uh, going to be correct uh, in this point of time. Although you might uh, come from the case uh, later on. So current treatment is classic mode of neoprofit, somatic pattern, assembly migraine, has been prevented to meditation. The unmet needs are she has no idea no sustained pain from this first. Uh, Successful if there is such a and there is no consistent relief, uh, it's no functional response and no returns. So, the treatment goal is restore function and sustained pain to response, clinical uh, goal to be achieved. So, most of the, the, the important things are educating the patient and demystifying the migraine from my previous slide to the clinical case. So the evidence based treatment options for migraine and acute migraine is paracetamol, non steroid lengthening, unmet medications, uh, combination therapy. Uh, I would uh, basically use the slide behind those uh, as fast as possible, as best as possible. You could use uh, dihydrocortisone uh, migraine specific medications, uh, uh, such as uh, the different varieties of triptan and naproxen, uh, ibuprofen. Again, 
So we did plan that just be careful in the case of hypertension, uh, skin heart disease, multiple uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, be aware of uh, some of the side effects. Those here must be just pain, chewing, dizziness, or antibiotics uh, and levodopine. Uh, the those are level B for acute migraine treatment. So nonetheless, uh, level C. Uh, there are a whole lot of uh, the antiepileptic drugs. Uh, uh, that you can use as acute therapy in intravenous form in GQ. I'm not a big fan of opioids in my head, they give the intention to say I will avoid the aspects that you can. You can use a steroid uh, or lipopane or celotoxin or acute like or promising IM or IV uh, for acute treatment, also the level of evidence is not strong. We do use them as still medication. So the acute treatment plan, the initial treatment, second line treatment, rescue treatment, choose wisely, three careful treatment, two careful treatment, Australia failed treatment. Uh, and so the child or the Italian who the patient that we're dealing with. And then give it by migraine, encourage one patient to apply its main problem for this blood function to prevention has to be by patient regular works, avoiding triggers, addressing medication use. And choosing my very specific medication as best as possible in the context. So, when there is yellow diarrhea, you can't give a hug when you go to patients. So, the, the, the basal space of the injections and supposedly can be useful when there is nausea, uh, the, the also some of these patients. As I said before, Acute migraine is all about switching and we be prepared to switch the medications. And so we diagnosed that Shanti as having a chronic migraine medication for this headache. We managed to demystify the migraine and take the uh, treatment and protein and all of the medications out. Uh, we encourage her to improve her physical activity. We encourage her to meditate, mindfulness based intervention, sleep hygiene tips. Uh, we use some of the non prescription medications like magnesium. Like uh, as they have good uh, migraine prevention in that aspect. Uh, she wore two caps uh, during the yoga class uh, and uh, the, she's going pretty well at this point of time. So at present, uh, the, uh, the still uh, 10 day based on month, uh, the nine percent success in sustained brain pain free response. Uh, rescue therapy is not needed. Uh, it's still a little bit of work to do with depression and anxiety. Why does it do from day 30? So always remember the patient that we are treating migraine, not just the headache. We don't keep things in the little box or the big box. We do this by treating the treating well and treating appropriately. And always remember the production of disability is important and this is campaign free response. So as I said, uh, it is very important for us to invest in the patient and the migraine and the service and patients. So again, hope you will come and join us on the Michael Foundation and join us with the uh, my expression of the food of the world migration we are in this also. Thank you very much uh, and uh, be safe uh, and take care uh, and uh, we continue your good work uh, and uh, we are uh, ever grateful for the big of the people at Google Commons, which is indeed the micro job. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pisil Jayaratna. Uh, now he's available for us if we have any questions uh, from the audience. So, um, So, Vijay, uh, I have a small question on uh, acute uh, migraine uh, pain relief. Do you have any experience with uh, using high dose uh, SK, like uh, in doses like 600 milligrams, 900 milligrams, giving stab doses? Uh, Damiga, can you hear me? Yes. 
So that is a great question. The impact, uh, the I didn't have time to go through. The way that uh, migraine work is, uh, there are multiple phases of acute attack of migraine. And I myself is a migraine sufferer. So basically what happened is, uh, you first have uh, what we believe as uh, neurogenic inflammation, uh, which is sterile inflammation happening in the back of the brain. Then you develop uh, what is known as uh, uh, the trigeminal cervical reflex. Uh, that's why most migraine patients uh, complain of neck pain with uh, headaches. And then uh, the, you develop what is known as sensitization phase, which is the phase three. So when we treat acute attack of migraine, we are basically raising. We are at a race with uh, these phases. Uh, so we wanted to win before the migraine uh, go into these two phases in patho pathological sense, not the graph that I shown in the presentation. What I shown in the presentation is the clinical features of the patient. Here, what I'm talking is uh, what is actually happening at molecular level. So to do this, uh, you have to hit acute attack of migraine very hard. So normally when I do feel that uh, an acute attack of migraine coming, I normally take uh, three tablets of aspirin or three tablets of ibuprofen, sometimes even four. So you are much better at uh, uh, hitting hard, hitting well, hitting as fast as possible. If you do that, uh, there's almost 70% chance that you can get rid of uh, the onset of uh, symptoms uh, the, the, to be limited under two hours. Uh, and also to be pain-free the next day morning, which is what I try to introduce as sustained pain-free pain response uh, during the presentation. So the answer to your question is yes, uh, I am a big believer of uh, treating patients uh, with uh, acute medications uh, at a higher dose uh, as early as possible. The, the danger is, again, I didn't have time to go through this. Uh, if a particular patient is uh, needing to take uh, these acute medications even at a higher dose uh, more often than usual, more than two days per week, uh, which means more than 10 days per month, uh, then they are going to develop what is known as MOH. Uh, this is not your MOH office, uh, medication overuse headache. So the medication overuse headache uh, must be avoided at any cost. And the only way to do that is uh, you advise your patient that if you need to take acute medications more than two times per week, that means uh, the our approach of treating acute headaches uh, are not working at the moment. Uh, now we have to go through preventative approach, uh, which I didn't go into uh, during the presentation. So that's the different kettle of fish altogether. Then you advocate uh, preventative medications for those patients. Thank you very much, uh, Prasakis Vijayaratna. It's a very informative lecture. Thank you again. Thank you very much for a very nice lecture. Uh, I'm Seneca, a uh, pediatrician from uh, Bangalore Hospital. Now, uh, because uh, there's a question, uh, the question is uh, uh, take children below 13 years, the incidence is very much less significant. But above that, uh, it's increasing. I mean, uh, adolescents at any age, migraine is higher. What is the explanation? Is it uh, lifestyle or it is uh, something to do with hormonal changes? Thank you. Thank you, sir, Professor Desiree, and thank you, sir, Dr. Dominika Rakha. Uh, it's time to refresh. Uh, we have uh, some refreshment direct outside the lecture hall. So, if you would please proceed and we'll recommence in 15 minutes as we are beginning the talk. Meanwhile, uh, online listeners, you are welcome to questions mentioned in the chat. And answers will be provided. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our next lecturer, Professor Ramya Jawadhar. And uh, Dr. Ramya Jawadhar is a professor in nutrition at the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and a visiting fellow to Queensland University of Technology, Australia. Following his medical graduation from the University of Colombo in 2005, he completed his MSc from the University of Glasgow, UK, and subsequently the PhD in Queensland University of Technology, Australia. Professor Javardhan has a vast array of research experience, which includes multinational clinical trials, national wide epidemiological surveys, case control studies, systemic reviews, and meta analysis, and qualitative research projects. He has over 90 paper publications in international peer-reviewed journals, four books, and over 100 abstracts. He has an H index of 28 and over 3,000 citations. According to the UGC research performance team, Dr. Chavagarana is one of the youngest to reach the tier four star highest rank in the Sri Lankan university system. In recognition of his outstanding achievements, he has awarded the CVCD Excellence Award for the most outstanding young researcher in the field of health sciences in 2018. So it's over to you, Professor Ali Jarvin. Please uh, enjoy your lecture. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for a kind introduction. And uh, uh, can you hear me? Can uh, can one can someone confirm whether you can hear me? Yes. Prabhat. Okay. And it, it's a great pleasure to uh, share some knowledge on the adult obesity in your prestigious forum. And probably this is like a second time I'm doing a, a presentation. Well, five six years before I did with the uh, part of SLMA, but it's good to do an, another presentation with your society. And Please allow me to share. Uh, can you please allow me to share my screen? I think I don't have a host uh, status. So, okay, thank you. And can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, can okay, great. And uh, today's presentation about uh, uh, adult obesity. And my main uh, specialty is uh, nutrition. So here I'm going to discuss about mainly dietary management of the adult obesity. And when I do this kind of presentation, most of, I mean, uh, professionals as well as general public, they they expect some magic pill for the weight loss, but there are no such a magic pill. But if I share some research we done in Sri Lanka, we found there are over 100 uh, weight loss products. And we conduct this study uh, three years before I published very recently in 2020. And within three months period, we could found uh, over 100 uh, weight loss products. So it shows this is a big issue in the Sri Lankan context. So in my presentation, first I'll discuss about uh, the background of obesity, mainly adult obesity. And we are quite proud. We have done a lot of uh, studies on this arena also. And there are many fat diet. And when I do this kind of presentation, one of the question is asked whether the keto diet is good or bad, you know, like that. So I will touch those uh, current misconceptions also regarding weight management. And obesity is due to actually behavioral uh, changes. One of the main behavioral problems is the dietary habits. So when you when you want to get obesity or weight loss uh, prescription or dietary prescription, you should know about our dietary habits. So 
in my presentation, I will discuss the Sri Lankan dietary habit as well. Then there are many weight loss strategies, but in this small presentation, I will discuss what some evidence-based concept we call plate model concept, which you all can practice as well as you can explain for your patients also. And uh, this is our national level study we did like uh, 2005, six period and published in 2010. And we covered almost all part of the country in 2005. Then I revisit this data in 2011. And what we found actually adult obesity level has reached to epidemic proportion in this country. So one third of Sri Lankan adults are over BMI 25. So this is a national problem. This is a national level public health problem. So you can't escape obesity, whatever the specialty you are working. Even you are working in the surgical department or medicine department or whatever orthopedic, whatever place, you always see the obesity patient. And that was a really important medical problem also for them because it leads for the several comorbidities. And there's another new research I want to share with you. We generally use this uh, Caucasians cutoff or international cutoff. Actually, those BMI cutoff are not very accurate for Sri Lankan. And very recently, uh, we published this data in the Ob Obesity Medicine Journal, and we found actually BMI of 23 is the best parameter to identify obesity in male and female both. And uh, you can use about BMI 25 as a last cutoff, but not a BMI 30. So if someone has over BMI 20, consider as overweight or they are at risk for the obesity, if someone is BMF over 25, surely they are in the obese category because they have excess body fat, uh, which is 30% for the men and 40% uh, for the women. Now I will go through a few fat diet. We call those, are, uh, those kind of diet come time to time. And one of the diet is this keto diet or ketogenic diet, and which is mainly low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And it has some amount of protein also. So what is the theory behind this keto diet? Then you are retraining your body to use fat as a main primary energy source because you don't provide much carbohydrate. And in that time, it reduces blood glucose level as well as insulin level. So what is the basic physiology behind that? Actually, there's an initial weight loss because if you don't take enough carbohydrate, you lose your glycogen stores in your liver as well as muscles to some extent. So with that, you will lose your body water. So that's say most of patients who start keto diet, they experience of losing two, three kilograms within a few days time because of the mainly water loss and glycogen uh, depletion. Then actually this high protein, high fat diet has a high satiety. It's probably in, in the first day you think, okay, eating eggs is quite tasty. But if you try to eat eggs for the every meal without any rice or without any bread, you really fed up with that kind of thing. So, so because of that, your patients, is reduce the appetite for the food intake. So long run, again, they get a less energy. Even they're having high fat, high protein, their total energy consumption will reduce. But there are a lot of downside of this kind of diet also. This increase of cardiovascular diseases, reason most this high fat diet are full of saturated and cholesterol and trans fat. So it increases the LDL level as well as triglyceride level. And it's expensive to follow in this kind of diet in Sri Lankan context. And it's not very practical also. Now, if someone want to have bacon, sausages, eggs, or something for the breakfast, it's very expensive compared to eating something like rice and vegetable and dal or chicken or something, which, which is relatively cheap. So those who start keto diet, they fail in the few weeks or months time because it's expensive and it's not very practical in Sri Lanka context because most of our traditional events assume like a new year. Yes, we have a milk rice. Assume it's a birthday party. Yes, we have a cake. Oh, everything is a carbs. So it's very difficult to follow. Other common misconception is uh, intermittent fasting. It's again very similar because if you don't eat food for the longer period, you are bo your body again go for the ketosis. And there are several types. And some, some patients, they have a, a fasting period for two days per week. And sometimes they fast 18, 14 or 16 or 18 hours. So again, it's very simple physiology behind that because you can't eat everything within six hours, which you usually eat for the 18 hours period. So your, your food consumption will reduce. With most of this intermittent fasting, they don't eat breakfast, 
they probably eat lunch and they don't eat dinner also. So you can't eat 2000 calories within a one meal. So they automatically they reduce the total intake also. But again, there are a lot of downfalls because foods provide actually not only calories, it provides micronutrient also, it provides dietary fibers, it provides vitamin minerals. So those who are having one meal or they have, when they cut down their food intake, they end up with a micronutrient deficiencies. And of course, when you don't eat for the longer period, as you know, we can't produce blood glucose from fat. So it's mainly coming from the breakdown of the glycogen when it's over, breakdown of muscle mass. So because of that, those who are following intermittent fasting, they lose their muscle mass. And, and one, one of the consequences of that, they reduce the metabolic rate also. So when they start eating normally one day, they put on everything what they lost. And again, long term, this is not practical because we enjoy food. So if you don't eat your breakfast or dinner for like a 10 years, probably you are not living in this world. So you don't, you don't get any social event. So we don't encourage this kind of pattern also. So those are the two things. So now you, you must think about what are the solutions we have. Yes, there are a few solutions. Actually, obesity is due to chronic energy balance. It's not your yesterday meal. Most of patients, they complain they are not eating, but still they are obese because they, they try to assume they have recent food intake for their current body weight. That's quite wrong. Most of patients gain weight or normal adult gain weight during like a 10, 20 years period. And in, in average, we gain around one kilogram per year. So now probably now we, if you are around 40s, probably you have gained 20 kilograms from your after school. So that's actually what average one kilogram per year. So if you get more energy than energy expenditure, it's deposited as a fat. So this is very simple mechanism for the obesity. So it's not due to, due to genetics or not due to any family reasons. Of course, they have some, some other factors like a hypothyroidism and Cushing syndrome. But if you take a epidemic of the obesity in this country, it's due to simple positive energy balance. It's not due to any hormonal problems or not due to any energetics. So if you can cut down your calories, then surely your deposit fat will burn out. And which is we call calorie deficit approach, but it is almost impossible in Sri Lankan countries. There are several reasons. Because first thing, we don't have a databases. Now, even we, we don't know the calories in our very simple dishes, like a sambole or dal curry. We don't know. And we don't know the calorie composition of our rice varieties. We don't know calorie content of our fish bun or egg bun. And because it's varied in one place, another place also. So we don't have food composition database. So if you don't have food composition, complete food composition database, you can't calculate calories. Second thing, these energy expenditure values. Now, actually weight gain is not due to only intake, it's due to energy expenditure also. Now we have to estimate our energy expenditure. And, and if someone not lose weight, they have to get less energy than their expenditure. But all these formulas are not standard for the South Asians. And I, I saw a very recent publication from, came from the India, from the very standard lab. And they found we, we burn 13% less than the Caucasians. So actually, probably we don't burn like a Caucasians or black people, but still we don't have a accurate formulas. Another thing, now if you take this kind of food label, these are quite misleading. Now this is for the very reputed company and probably leading company on the jam in this country. But you can see they haven't mentioned about, uh, they have mentioned the calorie content, but they don't mention about the carbohydrate content or fat content. Now, if you take this protein content and multiply by four, you get only 10 calories. So, but this 100 grams contain 183 calories. So there are, there's another 173 calories coming from somewhere else. So it is not from the fat because the amount of fat is very less. It is from the sugar here, but it is not mentioned. So if you, if you check this food label and if you try to calculate calories, it is almost impossible because those are not complete food labels. Another problem, these are different recipes. And probably if you go to one community, they make dal is very thick curry, especially in the Muslim community. But if you take a Tamil communities, they make dal is a very watery, dishes like a sambar. 
So you can see the the thickness of dal is very from one place to another place. So so calorie content also. So if you take this thick dal curry, which has a four times more calorie than this diluted dal curry. So if someone giving a diet history like eating bread and dal curry, but still we can't calculate because we don't know the recipes. So because of these old factors, it's very difficult to calculate calories in Sri Lanka. So what is the solution then? We need a solution. Then we have to identify our nutritional issues. If you know our nutrition issues, then you can change it. So again, we are quite proud of our data and we, we did the national level survey on the energy and nutrient intake. And what we found, irrespective of the gender and ethnicity, area of resident or BMI value and education level or age, or whether they have diabetes or not, we consume more than 70% of calories from the carbohydrate. And only 10% coming from the actual protein and 18% from the fat. So our main calorie source is a carbohydrate. So if someone want to cut down the total calorie intake, it's not a fat, it's not a protein, it's mainly carbohydrate. Why is that? Now, if you go for this kind of publication also, we found Sri Lankan consume more starchy food than the national and international recommendation. So this is the place to handle. Most of typical Sri Lanka meal like this, full of rice, some vegetables, some dal or some protein item, some gravy, but it's a full of rice. And if you take a, other Sri Lankan dishes also, like a tose or roti and hoppers, string hoppers and bread and milk rice, everything just carbs. And most of our breakfast and dinner is like this. So this is the area to, area to be concerned. Now, if you take a protein, we consume only 10% of protein. Actually, an international guideline recommend us to have a 15% of calories for the protein. So we, we are not protein consumed country very much. So that's not very important part. If you take a fat intake also, which is very low. And if you take a uh, UK data, they, they get more than 40% of calories from the fat. So international recommendations, 25 to 30%. So there's a main culprit is a fat, but in Sri Lanka, it's actually a carbohydrate. Protein, uh, fat is not an issue at all because we consume less than recommendation. And what we have another big issue in our dietary habits and we consume very little amount of vegetables also. Why vegetable is important for the weight loss plan? Because vegetables do not provide much calories. It's basically water and dietary fibers and full of nutrient. So generally vegetables do not contain sugar or starch or oil or very much. This, so it's very low calorie density food. But most of Sri Lankan dishes are not vegetable, like a potato curry and all these yam roots and all this jack, jackfruit, breadfruit and those jackfruit seeds. We eat like a vegetable curry, but they, they are not vegetable. They are simply starch. All these pulse varieties, like a, a dal varieties, a lentil varieties are not vegetable, but we eat as a curry. So those are not vegetables. So because of this different dishes in Sri Lankan context, but we consume as a curry, so we hardly eat vegetable. That's why there's an issue. So we have a few nutrition challenges in this country. One, we consume high starch food. Now, if you recall your breakfast, it's a full of carbohydrate. Now, if you take an English breakfast, which is mainly bacon, sausages, and egg, it's a zero carbohydrate meal. It's a full of fat and protein, but it doesn't have carbohydrate. But our Sri Lankan breakfast is probably string up or rice or bread or something. And we consume less protein also. This is also very important because if when you consume adequate amount of protein, it retains your muscle mass. Actually, muscle is a place we use energy. So if you have a less lean mass, so lean muscle mass, you don't burn calories also. That indirectly associated with your metabolic rate. And third thing, we consume less vegetable also. It's quite a sad situation because being a tropical country, we have a whole sort of vegetables, hill country vegetables and uh, low ground vegetables, but still we consume less vegetables. So what is solution then? Of course, if starch provide main calorie so we had to cut down carbohydrate intake. If a protein content food is less, then we have to increase the protein intake also. If we consume less vegetables, yes, we have to increase the vegetable intake also. So those are the three main strategies to overcome this main dietary challenges in obesity in this country, because we get mainly calories from the starch. So you have to cut down carbohydrate and you have to add some protein and add more vegetable to fill yourself. 
So there's some concept called plate concept, which is it's like a main take home message in this lecture. We all can practice. So this is very really evidence-based one. And half of your plate should be vegetable, quarter should be starch, and quarter should be protein. We consume other way. We consume two thirds of starch and some vegetable and some protein, not a half plate of vegetable. But all those, those international guidelines are not practical for Sri Lanka. Now, if you take this US model, we don't eat fruits with our main dishes. And probably we don't add dairy also in our main dishes. So this kind of plate, we cannot practice. And this is a British one, which doesn't show what we, what we eat in the plate. And now this is an Australian model, which just show the old food variety rather than the real plate. And this is actually Ministry of Health Sri Lanka model and which has like eight different food items. You know, Sri Lanka, we are not very, very rich country, so we can't have eight different food items. And again, this is not evidence-based. And these kind of guidelines come in with the, some people sit on the table and they, they, they came with the guidelines. So that's actually wrong guidelines. You had to back up your guidelines with the, the clinical trials. So, so what is the solution? We made this plate as a part of the research project in Medical Faculty Colombo. And in this plate, we encourage quarter should be starch and, and quarter should be protein also because we, we consume less protein and other half should be vegetables. But in Sri Lanka, we eat curry vegetable or mellum vegetable. So this dark green area for the green leaf vegetables, so in other words, this is mellum. And this green area for another green vegetable like uh, beans or long goat, like a patol or something. And other colored area for the another vegetable like a carrot or and other any, any type of vegetables. So you can practice this for the many food items and you can encourage your patients to follow this plate concept and evidence shows they will lose weight. And actually last year I, I received a uh, award from the National Science Foundation because this like a uh, main research finding in Sri Lanka. And so this is actually evidence-based. That's why we are quite strong about this data. We did a clinical trial. And on this plate concept, we did in a uh, card, card, uh, National Institute of Cardiology, NHSL. And this is a full paper. And what we did, we randomized 120 patients for the control group and, and intervention group. Intervention group, we gave this just a plate and few advices. And control group, they got a normal advices like a cut down fat, cut down salt, so on. And with the analysis, what we found with this concept, test group, that's no matter who got a, like a plate concept, they lost their weight and BMI significantly. As well as those who were like a normal BMI, that's me less than 23, did not have any effect also. So even you are not very obese, even you have a risk for the overweight, you still can use this because you don't lose weight with this kind of concept. But if you're only obese or overweight only, you lose weight. And this is published as a full book also if you are interested, we can arrange for the Medical Faculty Kalambu. And it is in the both language, English and Sinhalese. And how you can use this concept. Now, if you go through this presentation, you don't need a book actually. Now, when you eat white rice, this is something we get from the market. We get with a dal curry or some, uh, you know, some tempered uh, spirit, like a, or dry fish or some bowl or something. So this kind of that we get it. If you go to canteen or something, you get this kind of plate. It's quite tasty, but actually what you are eating, a lot of vegetables, very little vegetable, a lot of rice, very little vegetable, and very little protein also. So our suggestion, half of your stage should be balloon and vegetable. There should be a good amount of protein to fill yourself, and your rice should be only part of your plate. But this, this advice is not enough. You had to go a little more detail. Now in Sri Lanka, when you're making this green leaf vegetable, in other term, mallungs, we add coconut. Actually, coconut was full of fat and calories. So if someone wants to add coconut, they had to cut down the amount of coconut or they should use something else like onion or tomato or something. In other problems, Sri Lankan curry, we tend to add thick coconut milk or sometimes we temper it. In that kind of situation, they had to use a diluted coconut milk, like a diakiri. And fish or chicken should be something like a miriseta, like a spicy one. And rice should be only quarter of plate. And there are little more detail you should provide. If you start eating from this rice end, you always feel the amount of vegetable is more and you need more rice to serve and eat it. So we jelly and eat from this mellung end or the salad end. So when you finish this some, some vegetable, 
then you can mix it with rice and protein and eat it. Because then you already had some vegetable which reduce your appetite to some extent. Then you don't you don't ask for the rice further. This is not only for the white rice. You can apply for the many other food also. Now, if, if you want to have a red rice, it's the same concept. Red rice should be quarter. There should be good amount of protein, like a chicken or something. Yes, there should be green leaf vegetable. This is okara bandaka, and and some carrot or something. Again, you better start from this end. You can eat carrot and or malung or something easily without any rice. Then you can mix it and eat it. Even you can use for this like vegetarian dishes. And Sri Lanka vegetarian dishes are full of rice and hardly vegetable. And probably there's some gravy or curry or some dal or something. So this is very unhealthy meal. This kind of vegetarian dish actually leads for the diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. So how you can improve that? Again, half of your plate should be vegetable. And the, in the vegetarian dish, you have one of the main challenges getting adequate of protein. So what I encourage, there should be always some pulse vegetable like a beans or long beans and wing beans like a dumbbell or avara, those kind of beans variety. And there should be some mushroom variety also, which also provides some of the protein. Yes, if you can have soya or tofu or paneer, tofu or paneer are a little more calories, but soya meat is the best option. And of course, there should be melon with less coconut. It's not only for the rice, even it's called my rice bread. You can use still for the pasta also. Then it should be like this. Half, half should be salad because we don't eat pasta with a melung or something. So it should be salad and you can have a piece of pink salmon or something and pasta should be only quarter. You shouldn't add any cream or oil or anything. Yes, this can use for the even fried rice. We eat this kind of fried rice and with a chili paste and with a little vegetable, it's just we eat rice. That's very unhealthy meal, which is full of calories. So if you want to have fried rice, half of your place should be chopsy vegetable. And yes, you can have a grilled chicken devil or something. And only quarter should be rice. Again, it should start from this end, this end, then mix it and eat it. Not only for the those kind of things we eat in the plate, like uh, rice, pasta, noodle, you can use for the even chapati and bread also. But concept is there, but not in the plate like this. Now, if you eat a chapati with a gravy, that's very unhealthy. Well, if you go to North India, everyone is having a diabetes and metabolic problems because of eating chapati. Now, if you can make a wrap like this, you are using only very little wrap, but inside full of vegetables and some amount of protein also. You can add a chicken or if you're vegetarian, you can add a little cheese or something, but always it should be full of vegetables. Now, if you eat this kind of bread, this is a very common breakfast in Sri Lanka, wheat, roast, pang, or something, dal, curry, and some bolo, or something. You can eat even a full loaf of bread with this concept, but that again, very unhealthy habit. But if you want to improve it to a plate concept, you should eat like a sandwiches. I widely use for the, my patient. You can go for the high fiber bread varieties like a multi-seed, multi-grain bread, good quality protein like a tuna or chicken or something, but it should be full of vegetable. So it's like a, actually half plate of vegetable. You can see the thickness of sandwich, half is vegetable, which is lettuce, cucumbers, carrot, tomatoes, and this is a very healthy meal. However, there's a problem with this kind of dish. When you eat, plate it a full of vegetable, you feel hungry for within like a two, three hours time. For that, actually you should go for the healthy snacks. And for the every adult should eat two fruits per day to reduce your overall cancer risk and cardio, cardio metabolic risk. So, but don't eat fruit as a snack because it's also sugar, sorry, uh, uh, fruit as a dessert. So what I encourage, eat fruit as a snack in between main meals, like at 10 o'clock, probably four o'clock. Other, other snacks are having a handful of almonds or other, other nuts or a cup of yogurt or glass of milk or a cup of tea or something. So these are the snacks. It's very important to control your in between hung, hunger pans. In the, in the final slide, actually this weight management basically should be done by diet, but there's another limitation. You can't maintain those weight loss. So if you want to maintain the weight loss, you should provide the exercise advices also and I personally believe cognitive behavior therapy also very important part of this because if you don't change their thinking pattern and the, the behaviors, it's very hard them to maintain the weight. So in the summary, every patient should target to lose five to 10% of their body weight and they can take like a three to six months depending on their initial body weight. Thereafter, they have to do continuous exercise for the rest of their life. And in addition, you have to change their behavior pattern also. In the summary, 
as you can see, obesity is a major, major public problem in Sri Lanka, which affects for the 35% of Sri Lankan adults. And fat diet are not recommended. And major nutrient issues in this country is having high starch food and low protein and low vegetable intake. So plate model concept is a practical approach where you can cut down calories and improve their dietary habits also. But the final message is, if you work with the obese patient, yes, you should be like a role model. You should practice this concept as well as you should engage in the exercise. Otherwise, this behavior will change. So they will not listen to you. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take. I think I'm done on the time. So I'm, I'm happy to take any uh, chat uh, questions or any uh, verbal questions is fine. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Professor Anil. Actually, it's a very interesting and very informative lecture. So I hope uh, you've got uh, the basic concept what he has uh, lectured. And uh, because of the time constraint, we have only time for one or two questions. Please uh, be quick. And if there's any, it's a great chance to have your burning questions uh, going through a profession. Uh, so just uh, try one or two questions, please, because of the time constraint. Ranil, uh, I'm, I'm Rusi Shani Rodrigo from KDU. Um, thank you for that very informative lecture. Actually, we have tried the, the plate model on actually preschoolers, like, you know, trying to get the mothers to serve that. And it actually, it's a significant improvement on the diets that the, you have done on BMI. But we just looked at the plates that after about a month, the plate actually changes the way you showed. So it, was, it was very impressive. It was a small project done by some students of mine. And it was very encouraging to see that the diet changes and they actually continue to do that. After three months, this plate still remain more or less like what we wanted. So thank you for that and sharing that. And that's what we practice in our clinics also because pediatric obesity is uh, really a huge problem. And uh, we are trying to use the model to get the weights under control. Thank you. Absolutely, madam. It's very difficult. It's difficult than adult obesity. Ranil, I got a question from Melbourne. Great talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Uh, Ranil, uh, you did fantastic uh, work. How are you planning to get it across to all villages and all the, the, the towns in Sri Lanka to change the behavior and change the habit? Uh, what is in the pipeline? Yes, yes. actually, <laughs> we have done in the several level and in the now medical curriculum. And uh, we teach this concept for our medical students because they will be like a future doctors. And for the and uh, and uh, other doctors also. And uh, we 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 share this booklet and this presentation for the most of GPs in Sri Lanka. We, and I think we 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 sold over a thousand books and uh, the plate also. But there's, an, there's another side of this plate concept also, because in Sri Lanka still, the probably 20, 30% of pay, uh, people are suffering poverty. So vegetable is quite expensive at the same time. So there's other side. So it's probably this kind of concept is very suitable for someone uh, in, the, uh, in the middle class and who are inactive. But like a farmers and others, it will be a little difficult to practice because uh, they always complain about their uh, hunger or they, they are not satisfied with having a less price because this kind kind of the problem. But uh, now in the main sedentary groups, it is very quite effective. All right. Uh, Hope I answered you, your uh, question, sir. Uh, Ranil, actually, because we are uh, running out of time, we have to conclude this uh, session. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a pleasure to listen to your lecture. And thank you very much. We'll uh, move on to the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for, for your interesting note. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sainete Dinapilete, consultant pediatrician.